live. We are going live. I think we are live. Please do let me know in the chat uh, if things are coming through all right. Uh, there's one thing I forgot to do, which was going live on Instagram as well. But I believe I'm doing that as well. Um, and if I'm not, who cares? Uh, hello and welcome to live programming here at the Moore Freedom Foundation. Today we are going to be talking about developments in Yemen. Uh, really surprising developments and something that's kind of rare for, um, for Yemen developments. They're actually really positive. It seems like uh, we might be seeing... It's too way, 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 way too early to tell to talk about peace breaking out uh, in Yemen, but it's uh, it really does look like there are some seriously positive developments here that we should uh, all appreciate, celebrate, and try to encourage more of. Uh, if you could let me know in the chat, okay, good, I'm coming through. Um, so yeah, this is real. This is happening. This is uh, seems pretty cool, um, and. Um, Okay, so let's talk about the two things that are happening. Uh, to be clear, this is not going to be a larger, um, uh, a larger Q and A live stream. I'm only going to do this for a half hour, hopefully not more than 45 minutes. Uh, I'll take maybe some questions about Yemen, but um, the, the the idea here is to do a sort of brief uh, update that folks can click on and find useful. So two things have happened. Um, the first is a truce. I think uh, in promoting this live stream, I called it a ceasefire, and in research this morning, it's indicated that you should not call it a ceasefire, you should call it a truce. Um, a truce uh, between, oh, come on, uh, apparently there's some video issues, but um, uh, the truce is real um, between uh, the Houthis and uh, the Saudi coalition government uh, and the Saudi UAE coalition as well. Um, it is put in place on April 1st, and it's still holding a week later. There have to be, been, to be clear, numerous violations of this truth. I think it's probably fair to say, uh, primarily on uh, the um, uh, primarily on the Houthi side. But regardless, it's still holding because the truce is important enough to both sides of this conflict. And I think it might actually be uh, endorsement of the U.S. policy to essentially. Do nothing, um, not in a broader sense, but in the sequence of events that took place this fall, this winter, and into this spring. I'll talk about that for a second. But first, I just want to say that the extraordinary development, the extraordinarily positive thing that has happened um, in um, the uh, Yemeni sort of sphere, the extraordinary development that has occurred, is um, the. Um, uh, the extraordinary development that has occurred is that Abed Rabo Mansour Hadi, uh, a guy whose name I always mispronounce and has, seems to be spelled differently in every English language source, um, is done. He's out. This is uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the president of Yemen uh, who had been president, I guess this was the 10th year of his two-year term. He was expected to be a transitional president in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. Uh, much like uh, uh, Dabiba in Libya, who's been there for about a year and is already losing power. Um, this was a guy who was meant to be sort of a temporary stopgap, was elected in um, the um, was elected in the aftermath of the um, Hey Logo, can you there's a guy disrupting the chat. Could you please just block him? <laughs> uh, or, you know, just temporary put him on a timeout or whatever. Um, the um, uh, this guy was supposed to be just elected for a um, uh, was supposed to be elected for just a, a two year term. He was unopposed. There was like sort of a nice sort of friendly referendum thing or what have you. Um, but it was um, uh, he's a deeply deeply illegitimate figure. Uh, was I think resigned. Was chased out of the country. And then because Saudi Arabia wanted to invade Yemen and they wanted a veneer of legitimacy for it. They set up Yemen um, again as a, um, they set up Hadi again as their sort of pet president. And he's been preserved in that position, despite the fact that he's widely loathed, not just by the Houthis, the folks who control the majority of Yemen and have throughout this conflict, the folks that Saudi Arabia and the UAE are primarily attacking. Hadi was also loathed by most of the people in the uh, sort of 20% of population population. 
um, that was controlled by the Saudi coalition. So he was just disaster and he's gone and that's phenomenal. Um, and we'll talk about the implications of that in a minute. Let's talk about the ceasefire. Um, developments in Yemen, um, you know, Saudi Arabia and the UAE invaded in 2015. Uh, the United States provided all kinds of cover for this, uh, specifically at the United Nations. We pushed through an international veneer of legitimacy for this very straightforwardly imperialist action by Saudi Arabia and UAE invading the poor country to the south. Um, this um, was aided, of course, by the fact that Hadi um, was nominally the internationally recognized uh, president. Um, he wasn't even really under any reading of Yemeni law or international law. He wasn't. But the U.S. Uh, com combined with Saudi Arabia and UAE bribery forced through um, some U.N. Security Council resolutions saying that Hadi should somehow, for some reason, be put back in power. Um, so that sort of launched this war in 2015. Saudi Arabia promised the Obama administration it would be like three months um, now it's like um, seven years later. It's a horrific conflict. Estimates are that 400,000 people plus have died in this pointless conflict. And it's it's one thing to be doing um, nasty 19th century style imperialism. That's bad enough that we're allowing uh, the Saudis to do this. Um, but what makes it even worse is that it's been tremendously unsuccessful. And Hadi has been a big part of that. Um, there was some initial uh, success. It's, to be clear, in 2015, the Houthis had won a civil war and controlled the vast majority of the country, including aid in the port city in the south, which is now probably the most populous, most important non-Houthi city today. Um, in the initial months of the uh, Saudi UAE invasion, they were able to push the Houthis back out of territories where the Houthis, you know, didn't really have much historic affinity. They were just there because they were stronger. Um, and, um, but within a few months, three to six months, the, um, the, the battle lines sort of solidified in 2015. And while the UAE was a somewhat competent military force who could move things, move the, the, the battle lines in very small ways, I think through 2016, 2017, 2018, the Houthis slowly worked their way up the West Coast, uh, sorry, the UAE fighting the Houthis slowly worked their way up the uh, West Coast of Yemen. But by 2019, the outcry against this horrific invasion that Saudi Arabia and UAE had been doing and failing at for five, four years at that point, um, the outcry was so large that the United Arab Emirates basically just backed off. Um, they certainly maintained, as we will discuss shortly, they maintained massive um, uh, a control over, um, uh, you know, elements within Yemen. Uh, really, the only um, elements with any power or actual control of territory in Yemen um, are UAE clients, not Saudi clients, um, with, the, I think, partial exceptions of Marib, depending on how you mention it. So anyway, 2019, the UAE jumped out. In the end of 2021, this is just this past fall, the Houthis were after years of pushing, we're making real serious progress against Marib, which is a city out in the, uh, you know, basically on the edge of the desert that makes up most of Yemen's territory. If the Houthis had taken Marib, then the war would essentially be won by the Houthis. Um, you know, they were never gonna make their way back into the south, but if they took Marib, they would have complete control of the north, would be able to threaten the Saudis along a wide border, um, would control the, the oil. And basically, in, the, in the, the December of 2021, it looked like that might really happen. And this was such a serious real threat to the Saudi UAE invasion, Saudi UAE influence within Yemen, that the UAE decided for the first time in two years that they were going to seriously contribute to the conflict again. And what they did is they uh, put a force, I think, I believe it's the Giants Brigades, a uh, very heavily UAE-sponsored force that had been sort of holding down territory on the uh, on the west coast was transferred to Marib and quickly. So what happened in the the December? I think it was November or December of 2021. Was the Houthis made real progress and were getting very close to Marib? Then in January, the Houthis transferred the Giants Brigades um, to um, um, to. Uh, 
the outskirts of Mrib, where the Houthis were, were, were becoming victorious, and the Giants' brigades managed to push them back for the first time in quite some time, managed to push um, the, uh, the Houthis. And it was really the first time in like four years that the Houthis had lost any territory at all. It was territory that they had just gotten the month before, but it absolutely was a real stopping of Houthi uh, momentum. And the way that the um, uh, the way that the Houthis retaliated against this was to very famously, this is probably the only news you've heard out of Yemen over the past year, um, very famously bomb the UAE for the first time and bomb uh, more high-profile events in Saudi Arabia. Like I think the Formula One races uh, were being were being bombed uh, by the Houthis in Saudi Arabia. Um, and of course, because our media is insane, uh, rather than reacting like this to this the way that we react when Ukraine bombs uh, Russia with you know celebration, oh finally good, you know retaliation, which is exactly what the Houthis were doing against the UAE and Saudi Arabia, two countries that have been invading uh, Yemen for seven years now. Um, instead of celebrating it as retaliation, it was viewed as terrorism, and uh, Washington D.C. was filled with. Very bad ideas, like adding Yemen's government to the uh, Yemen's real government, the Houthis, to the list of uh, foreign sponsors of terrorism or what have you. Um, really bad ideas, like oh, let's put U.S. troops directly in the war in Yemen against the Houthis, against an indigenous resistance movement. Really, really bad ideas. Um, I've talked about you know Saudi Arabia and, and the UAE were like, oh, we want a NATO of our own now. And what I think is interesting is I've been certainly very vocal and many others have been vocal about how bad these ideas are. Um, but what's been interesting is the Biden administration has been polite about it and is trying to get the UAE and Saudi Arabia to uh, polite, uh, pump more oil. So I don't think has openly condemned any of these things, but hasn't actually done any of these things. And I think the fruits of the U.S. just sitting back and not doing anything, I think, have been shown in this ceasefire. So what we had... Um, this this sort of February, March, um, was the Houthis, after two years of pushing uh, to take Marib, this has been really their main focus for years now, um, have essentially failed. They've been pushed back. And uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE have realized that um, the United States isn't just going to uncritically jump and take their side of the story um, to sort of endorse and defend them uh, for... Um, their invasion of their poorer neighbor, you know, their sort of Saddam Hussein, Vladimir Putin type behavior. Um, and I think that's why we've seen a real shift. That's why we've seen a real um, ceasefire, sorry, a real truce, not a ceasefire, uh, but a two month uh, sort of Ramadan tr truce is my understanding of what we have. Um, I think Houth the Houthis understand this as a truce in that they will no longer bomb Saudi Arabia and the UAE, but they are free to push against the Saudi proxy governments. Um, obviously, that's not the Saudi UAE or the proxy government's opinion or the international community's opinion. But it seems that this ceasefire with some limited um, relief of the uh, Saudi embargo on the Hodeidah port that the Houthis control and the Sana airport that the Houthis control seems to be holding tentatively a week in, which is phenomenal news. And what's really extraordinary, what's really fascinating um, sort of the meat of this is that um, Saudi Arabia's reaction um, to this truce is to really double down and solve a serious, serious problem, um, which has been the Hadi government. Um, the president, as I mentioned, Abu Rabo Mansour Hadi, uh, president since 2012, he was elected in an unopposed election. This was in the context of a na na national dialogue conference. The idea was that Hadi was supposed to be transitional, um, was supposed to be um, uh, setting up real elections that are, were competitive. And he did such a bad job um, in his two-year post that he not only did the Houthis take over the country, um, he also uh, fled the country, resigned his post before Saudi Arabia decided to sort of reinstate him. So yeah, he is in the 10th year of a two-year term, or rather he was in the 10th year of a two-year year term until yesterday. And it's not just Hadi that was binned yesterday, which is really important. There was also Ali Mohsen al Amar, who is who was, was the vice president until yesterday. I believe Hadi's last act before transferring power to an eight-man presidential council 
was dismissing Ali Mohsen al Amar, his vice president, since 2016. What's important to talk about uh, Hadi and al Amar is that they are both mainstays of the regime that was in control of Yemen for 30 years uh, prior to the events of the Arab Spring. Uh, the, the war in Yemen uh, was, I think it overstates to say it was launched by the Arab Spring, but it is certainly a, in the war in Yemen starting in 2014, the civil war that the Houthis won, um, and then the Saudi em uh, Emirati invasion to try to dislodge the, to the Houthis, which has failed. Um, starting in 2015, were outgrowths of the 2011 Arab Spring, which unseated, I think it took until 2012, but did unseat Ali Abdullah Saleh, the dictator of Yemen from, I believe, 1979 until 2012. Um, the second biggest event since the Saudi invasion was, of course, the death of Saleh in December of 2017. Um, that was the biggest, this is the second biggest event, I would say, since the invasion, uh, the dethroning of Hadi. But what's important about Saleh this guy who was dictator for 30 years and then actually allied with the Houthis um, against his old administration, against his old regime, um, after he was kicked out, he allied with the Houthis until he tried to put one over on the Houthis and they killed him um, in 2017. Uh, Hadi um, and Al-Hamar, Hadi the president until yesterday, Al-Hamar the vice president until yesterday, were both key parts of Salah's regime. Al-Hamar specifically um, I, I've, uh, accounts of the Yemeni government for 30 years, some of them talk about it as if it's a triumvirate and that, that al Amar actually kind of chose Saleh to be president because being a president of Yemen in the 70s, uh, sorry, this would have been North Yemen at the time, um, you know, being president of North Yemen in the 70s or South Yemen in the 70s was an extraordinary lethal thing. So people, uh, some argue that actually Ali Mohsen al Amar, the vice president who was kicked out yesterday, um, he's a 76 or 77-year-old man, um, was actually the power behind Saleh, Yemen's dictator, since 1979. Um, Hadi uh, was actually a South Yemeni politician. Um, South Yemen was wrapped into Yemen first voluntarily, I believe, in 1991, and then the Southern Yemenis were like, actually, no, we hate this, and there was a vicious civil war um, in 1994 that the North won, that Saleh won. And Hadi, uh, from 1994 was actually Saleh's vice president. Um, I think you can argue that he was nowhere near as powerful um, a, uh, uh, a figure in that regime as Ali Mohsen al Amar or Saleh himself. But from 1994 until 2012, Hadi was the vice president of Yemen. Crucially, he was a southern Yemeni military figure and politician, but what he did to become powerful in Yemen as a whole is he became the face of North Yemeni, the Saleh regime's crushing of South Yemen. So after the civil war in 1994, um, you know, Hadi became the sort of quizzling, the collaborator, the, the northern repressive regime's guy uh, in the south who crushed uh, the south, which is very interesting because the only place where the Saudi UAE coalition has had any success at all in defeating the Houthis is in the South. So this is just the insanity, the stupidity of the Saudi UAE invasion. I mean, it's, it's, it's criminal. It would be criminal regardless. It would be Putin-like, Saddam Hussein-like behavior regardless, but just how absolutely insane and idiotic it has been. So the reason, I believe, that, Saudi, that, that the Saudis, specifically more than the UAE, have stuck with Hadi for a decade is because he does have that veneer of leg legitimacy. He was actually, at one point, an elected president of Yemen. Um, so they sort of held on to him because it's much easier for the New York Times to write an article talking about the internationally recognized government of Yemen when they're talking about Hadi, a guy who actually was elected in 2012, and they can just leave out the part about him resigning, running out of the country. And uh, very quickly, um, Hadi, I think, was uh, installed in Aden in 2015 um, or 2016. You know, okay, here's the government. This is the, the real Yemeni government that's going to fight against the Houthis that control 80% of the population and most of the land, uh, most of the useful land. Uh, a lot of folks who uh, are sort of... Uh, 
pulling for the, the, the internationally recognized Hadi Saudi UAE government will point out that, no, 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 the Houthis only control, you know, 30 percent of Yemen's land. But again, as with any conflict in this region, you have to pay attention to where the deserts are. The Houthis have always controlled the vast majority of the parts of Yemen where people actually live. Um, so 2015, 2016, um, uh, Hadi was installed in the south in Aden, the biggest city that was retaken by the Saudi um, uh, Emirati imperial invasion, was installed there and then quickly fell out with the actual southern militias who were working with the UAE Saudi coalition because he's the guy who repressed the south for um, 20 years. Um, uh, so Hadi was always a really weird freaking choice. And Ali Mohsen al Omar was also kind of a weird choice um, because he's traditionally affiliated with ISLA, which is a sort of Muslim Brotherhood Party. And famously, the Saudi Arabia and especially the United Arab Emirates really hate the Muslim Brotherhood everywhere else, but they were so desperate for people to work with that um, they stuck with Ali Mohsen al Omar. So it's really important to point out that not just that Ali Mohsen al Omar and, and Hadi aren't just illegitimate because they were propped up by foreign invaders. They were illegitimate because they were key parts of the nasty Saleh regime dict slash dictatorship that, that had ruled the country for 30 years. Um, so it was always kind of ridiculous. I, I, I'm, I'm always pretty open about the fact that I'm much more sympathetic to the Houthis in this conflict. I think they're a nasty, nasty group. They're anti-Semitic. They've got a flag and a chant that's really an anti-America, anti-Israel, that, you know, that they suck. But um, just like the, the Azov Battalion in Ukraine, they are an indigenous resistance group fighting against an outside invader. So I've always been pretty pro-Houthi. And the fact that the Saudis' prime guys on the ground in Yemen had always been Hadi and Ali Mohsen al-Amar made it much, much easier to be sympathetic towards the Houthis. It's important to point out that not only did these folks um, uh, create incredible problems with the southern Yemenis, the only folks who are actually uh, in, you know, indigenous to Yemen fighting on the side of the Saudi UAE invaders, also these folks were unacceptable to um, the Houthis in, in very deep ways. I mean, Hadi was a guy, a failed president, the Houthis kicked out of the country. Um, and Ali Mohsen al Omar uh, was in charge of the military um, during the cycle of anti-insurgency, anti anti-Houthi wars um, that the Saleh regime fought and lost through 2004 to 2009. Um, that uh, I think in 2009 we uh, actually brought the initial Saudi invasion to try to crush these Houthis that um, the, uh, the Yemeni government, Yemeni regime at that point, were failing to do. So Ali Mohsen al Omar is uh, by many, blamed by many Houthis for killing the, the namesake, the, the initial leader of the Houthis. You know, he's like, he might have actually like launched in a, in, in a real way, he helped to launch the Houthis as a, as a resistance movement. So it was always pretty freaking ridiculous to try to get the Houthi movement um, to sit down with um, the, the internationally recognized government. These are figures that are completely unacceptable not just to the Houthis again, but also to the people, many of the people who were actually successfully fighting against the Houthis on behalf of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So what happened yesterday was essentially Saudi Arabia said, enough, we're done with Hadi, and we're actually going to make a serious effort towards peace. Now, it's not guaranteed that it'll be towards peace. It could be towards... Um, uh, towards a fighting force that can actually fight the Houthis. And I, I would not want that. I definitely want peace. But it is interesting just looking at the way that I look at this. Like, I've always been someone who leans very heavily towards the Houthis. But if this, if this presidential council works, and it's an eight-member team of folks who hate each other, <laughs> but if this works, like, these are actually folks who do control territory, whether it's desert oases or coastal territories. These are folks who really do control territory in Yemen. They are real legitimate figures. Hadi spent most of the past seven years sitting in Riyadh, sitting in the Saudi Arabian capital, pretending to run a government. 
Um, this presidential council is entirely illegitimate. Let, 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 I mean, let me let me qualify this for a second. Um, we're learning more and more about how this presidential council was set up, and it's frankly ridiculous. Like this was set up in Saudi Arabia. Um, there's some reporting. I don't. This is only one reporter. Um, this isn't necessarily the true, the whole truth, but I think there's elements of it that are true. Um, it seems very likely that Hadi was coerced um, into doing these things, into making these moves by the Saudi government. Um, the eight-member presidential council was invaded. It was invited to Saudi Arabia um, on on the pretext of having um, conversations, uh, you know, attempting to settle peace. What's one of the most absurd things about? The Saudi UAE invasion of Yemen is that they've spent almost as much time trying to establish peace between their own proxy militias as they have, you know, f actually negotiating with the Houthis or even fighting the Houthis. So this was supposed to be just another in a long line of, of arrangements. And apparently the Saudi government presented this as like a fait accompli. It was basically told Hadi that this eight-man presidential council was here to replace them and told the presidential, the eight men who now are the presidential council that Hadi had decided that they were going to replace him. I mean, very much a, a incredibly shady process. It's not necessarily that shady, but more and more reporting seems to indicate that that's, that's what happened. The Saudis just basically picked a new government, um, which is quite, quite insane. <laughs> Um, and illegitimate, but this is vastly more legitimate. It like to have a process like that with sort of classic Saudi hostage diplomacy, like you know locking up half the royal family in the Ritz to rob them, or uh, you know uh, forcing the Lebanese prime minister, or was it president, to resign when he's visiting Saudi Arabia. This is very much in that vein, but. Saudi behavior and the Saudi proxy government prior to this was so bad, was so incredibly bad um, that this is actually an improvement. <laughs> um, so I think it's really important that like this is, you know, what was the Arab Spring and what have you. Like the Arab Spring is something that is lost entirely, which is something that I've talked about. But this is also kind of a final victory um, to see the Saudis root out the last remnants of um, – Yemen's sort of 30, 32 year uh, regime, Ali Mohsen Al Amar and Hadi, um, is actually kind of a kind of a strange thing. It is a it is a new order. It is a it is a a, a changing of the guard, um, and I think it's very much a, a, a good thing. Um, I think it is. I think it's a. I think it's. I think it's a good thing. Uh, Murari says serious effort. It's political nonsense. Saudi Arabia taking more direct control over from Hadi, but that's the thing. Um, Saudi Arabia was always directly in control over Hadi, and Hadi was in the Saudi capital for the entire time. These eight men are at least people who are on the ground and have real constituencies and real power within Yemen. Um, I'm not saying I'm like I agree entirely that this is an outrageous, um, uh, uh, ridiculously. Uh, absurd uh, process to try to select a new government, but it's more legitimate than the one that uh, the Saudi Arabia had been trying to foist on Yemen for the past eight years. Um, this is, you know, the end of the old order. To be clear, I think Ali Mohsen Al Amar, well, he has said, of course, I accept, you know, what my Saudi sponsors have told me I have to accept. Um, I think Ali Mohsen Al Amar, even though he's turning 77 this year, has the potential to be a Salah style spoiler or a, to use a, a, a um, Libya parallel again, a sort of Haftar style spoiler. I mean, I'm sure what Alamar says, of course, I, I accept the results of the presidential council until it goes down in flames and I find a way to insert myself into power again. Um, it is really, I just, you know, even if this comes to complete disaster, even if the presidential council just decides, okay, now we're going to, you know, make the war more intense and nasty. It is a victory for humanity. It is a victory uh, for the Arab Spring. It is a victory um, for common decency um, and just sort of truth in politics that Hadi is done. Ali Mohsen Al Amar, the vice president, this, you know, very powerful military figure of 40 years standing, 43 years standing in Yemen, um, could come back. Hadi will not. That's a victory. That's a phenomenal thing. I think it's important to point out that what Saudi Arabia has actually sort of sacrificed legitimacy, um, you know, I don't know, you know, how can 
Uh, it will actually. I, the the international community, like you know, the U.S. media will continue to describe uh, this farce as the internationally recognized media. Uh, it's our internationally recognized government, but it, it's I mean so farcical that, that I, th- I don't think anybody can really take that seriously. So Saudi Arabia has sacrificed legitimacy for sort of strength and honesty here, um, and I think it's you know. Anybody's going to say this. The presidential council has said, oh, of course, we recognize there's no military solution, yada, yada. But, you know, that's not necessarily going to actually mean anything or be particularly um, useful or worthwhile. I mean, not anybody was going to say that. But it is possible. It is possible, um, especially when you consider that Saudi Arabia and the UAE have now let a lot of the fig leaves of legitimacy fall away. It's entirely possible that this presidential council um, is intended and will attempt to negotiate peace. I believe the Houthis have already come out to condemn this presidential council. That also was always going to happen. Um, But um, I I, I think in a conflict where there's no hope, um, and I am usually very pessimistic uh, about, um, I think there's real hope right now. Um, And I think that's pretty phenomenal and pretty rare. the eight-member presidential council, another really interesting thing about this, um, I think partially the absurd um, performativeness of Saudi Arabia sort of summoning these people and being like, you are now the Yemeni government, um, I think might actually be covering up a bit uh, of the fact that Saudi is sort of acknowledging, Saudi Arabia is acknowledging just how much more power the UAE has. Um, a lot of these figures are Southern Transition Council or UAE-sponsored uh, figures. I mean, there's still Isla, um, the old Muslim Brotherhood Women Party, does still have two seats of the eight, you know, of this eight seats. Um, but a lot of these figures are much more strongly UAE sponsored um, uh, figures. Um, so it is interesting that Saudi Arabia is sort of taking this performative role in selecting the new government that also kind of formalizes Saudi lack of influence um, over the opposition of the Houthis compared to the UAE. Um, so yeah, I think this is good. This is good movement. Um, um, do we have any Yemen questions? I'll do like maybe five minutes and then I think we're going to, uh, cut this short because I want it to be short enough that people click on it. Uh, yeah, we agree on the point hundred percent last year. I said the best chance of Saudi war ending is just MBS giving up. Sad to see my prediction come to pass. I mean, this is MBS giving up to a degree, but not as much as we'd hope. Um, Serious effort, I'd say, how do you view Ansar Allah and its future as a political entity, specifically in relation to its foreign policy with uh, Saudi Arabia and America? Um, Ansar Allah, this is the formal name of the Houthis. Um, They're an indigenous resistance movement, and they're a successful indigenous resistance movement. Uh, It's impossible, uh, as an American, (laughs) um, as somebody who, you know, supports the continued existence of Israel, um, to, like, support Ansar Allah. But I think it's possible to recognize that the Houthis do not actually pose any real threat to Israel, do not actually pose any real threat to the United States, are taking positions very similar to the position that the you know, North Vietnamese um, you know, were taking when we were actively murdering them. Um, and make no mistake, the United States is actively choosing to murder Yemenis and murder Houthis. That's, that is our policy. We provide... Um, similar levels of intelligence support to the Saudi bombing. Uh, we provide contractors that keep the Saudi planes flying. Um, you know, it's all our missiles um, that are hitting Yemen. Um, so, yeah, um, I don't like Ansar Allah. I don't like the Houthis. I think, you know, if this presidential council holds together and actually, you know, functions as a cohesive government for the first time, um, I'm never going to be sympathetic to uh, this, you know, fully sympathetic to this government. It, it is a proxy force for an invader. Um, but I will certainly be more, you know, sympathetic to them than I was the Hadi and al and that will shift me further away from the Houthis. Um, but um, what do you think USA will do about Yemeni people starving? Um, I think, honestly, um, in the context of what, you know, if the U.S. really wanted to stop um, Yemeni starving, we would stop backing the Saudi blockade of the country, of the, you know, the, the parts of Yemen where 80% of Yemenis live. We apparently don't want to do that, but I think as a, as a very, very, very sad last ditch, um, the fact that Biden, the Biden administration refused to co-sign any of 
Saudi Arabia's sort of uh, BS plans for, um, you know, retaliation or more terrorist or organization designations or this, that, or the other thing. I think that was a very positive thing that the Biden administration did and actually has gotten more fuel into Yemen. Um, uh, how does Yemen impact Egypt and the Grand Renaissance Dam in Ethiopia? Oh, man, that's, that's getting, I think that's getting at, thanks, Matt Elman, I think that's getting out of the Yemen. Uh, I will take one, or one more Yemen question, and I want to close this before we hit the 40-minute mark. Um, how, how likely is it that once Saudi Arabia collapses, the UAE takes over the nation and also Mecca and Medina? Not likely at all. I think one of the things that makes the United Arab Emirates more viable than Saudi Arabia is the fact that it has a small population. Um, yes, it has a, you know, a military that supposedly strikes, you know, uh, well, certainly strikes above its weight and is much more competent than Saudi Arabia. They have better diplomacy. But most importantly, they have a ton of oil and gas resources like Saudi Arabia. But unlike Saudi Arabia, they don't have a tremendous population or geography they have to manage. They have uh, resources uh, that are that are very high, and it's great for the tiny territory. And the, yeah, I mean, how many, there's like 10 million people who live in the UAE and like, and like 1 million or less um, actual UAE citizens. Um, it's very easy with the resources they have to build something that's potentially sustainable. Um, I could totally see the UAE, if, you know, Saudi Arabia falls, the UAE being like, oh, look, we've totally got a parliament now. You know, like they have the resources to like put together some kind of, you know, weird oligarchy in a post-monarchy way and still be run by the same people. Um, and uh, but if the UAE decided to take over the Hejaz, take over, you know, Saudi Arabia, no, I, that would not be that would not be um, that would no longer be viable and would have the same problems that Saudi Arabia does. So I don't see that as much of a problem. OK. Um, oh, God. Peter Parker with her standard anti-Israel nonsense. Um, let's see. This sounds like Rafe argument. OK, I think we're going to close there. I wanted to do this update on Yemen, uh, make a short update on Yemen. I believe I have done that. Thank you, folks, for being here, um, and I hope you found this presentation useful. Thanks so much.